But let's uh, get straight to our next guest, the first one this hour. Thomas Hayes is Chairman Managing Member at Green Hill Capital, joining us uh, from New York with his thoughts on the markets. Uh, Will stays on for this conversation. Tom, good to have you on the show. Thank you very much for joining us uh, late to your side. Um, give us your own sense. I mean, what happened with the text yesterday? Do you think that it's time uh, people started to focus on, on the big techs after the big sell-off? Yeah, I think people have shifted gears. I think people expect growth is going to be a little bit slower. We had the cyclical trade last year, but now as GDP starts to normalize, people want to look for those groups uh, that can operate well in a slowing growth environment or a slightly slower growth environment. Certainly value tech, big tech, we've seen a big bid off the June lows uh, as the 10-year yield has come in, as Will was referencing. Uh, we like biotech. We, we, last time we were on your show, we talked a little bit about biotech. Uh, that's now up 53.5% off of the May lows. We think that's getting just getting started. And the reason being, if you look back at the last tightening cycle, uh, biotech also collapsed about 50% in anticipation of the tightening cycle from 2015 to early 2016. And then during the tightening cycle from 2016 to 2018, we saw biotech, namely the XBI equal weight ETF, uh, rally 140% off of those lows. So we think we could be seeing a similar situation, albeit uh, we've had a big rally here in the short term. We could expect some consolidation. But I think if you look one to two years out, that's the type of group that can really perform uh, in a slower growth environment. Thomas, you might be based in New York, but you, 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 I mean, I look at your notes, you seem more like an Asian investor, uh, yeah. and especially now with a big heavyweight in China and some of the ASEAN countries, also India, part of that list. Uh, uh, do you think that at a time when the dollar index is inching higher, and, you know, Will alluded to that, uh, that this could be a great entry point, uh, you know, getting the uh, currency bias as well as where the equity markets stand for a lot of these uh, countries? Yeah, we, we particularly like out of favor sectors uh, and groups. We think the dollar has actually run quite a bit. And one of the things that we look for uh, in terms of the dollar is the weekly commitments of traders report from the CFTC. And what they're showing right now is something that they show frequently before major corrections. And that is the commercials have been aggressive net sellers of the US dollar futures uh, for the last few months. And that usually precedes some weakness in the dollar, which is paramount for the emerging markets to take off. As a matter of fact, if you look at the emerging markets over the last 30, 40 years, uh, the performance of emerging markets relative to the S&P 500 is the lowest since it's been uh, since the 2001 to 2002 period. And uh, shortly thereafter, it had a 390 percent run uh, uh, over the next four or five years. We think that the situation is setting up where emerging markets, if you look three to five years out, from a demographic standpoint, from a policy standpoint, and potentially from a weakening of the dollar, that's going to be your key trigger. As you see the dollar weaken, if it takes six months, if it takes 12 months, that's when emerging market flows are really going to kick off. And China is now 33, it's 33.5 percent of the emerging markets waiting. It's being moved up to 33.8 at the end of this month. Tom, I'm just, it's Will here. I've just got to push back a little bit when it does come to the dollar. Yes, you did mention 6 to 12, but when you see what's happening in Europe and you see the weakness that could potentially be playing through that hasn't necessarily fully been priced in yet, don't you think that just on the back of the, the weakness playing through for the euro and it's waiting on the dollar index that it could leave a little bit upside for the US dollar? And I'm not even factoring in the fact that the Fed is calling for 4%, whereas the markets are calling for maybe 3 <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's no question in the short term, and that's why you've seen the bid. But, but I think, Will, when you look at this, it's, it's backward looking. Uh, what we're going to see, I think, uh, in the Fed minutes in July is some hawkish talk. That really doesn't matter much because that was before the CPI and the PPI report. I, I think what's going to really matter is Jackson Hole. And what you're seeing in terms of quantitative tightening is that they've only sold one third of the amount of bonds that they had expected to sell by this time, which means they're being more and more accommodative than the market had, had expected. I think you're going to see a reset of expectations in terms of the quantitative tightening timeline uh, moving forward. And that these type of dovish actions, if we get another uh, reasonable CPI print in September and maybe the Fed goes 50 basis points instead of 75 basis points or even 25 basis points, uh, all of these type of pivots, the slowdown and tightening is going to lead to the dollar starting to weaken. 
Uh, we were kind of first to tighten. The dollar got a huge bid on that in terms of relative yields. As, as those yields have come in, those relative yields are less and less attractive. So we do think by the end of the year, despite uh, the overhang in Europe, et cetera, uh, that we could st start to see some normalization of the dollar, uh, and that will uh, give good flows into the emerging markets. And that's going to be a long-term trend for the next three to five years. We could start to see some emerging markets outperformance. Uh, did I just hear you right? You flagged the potential that there could be a 25 pip only hike coming through from the Fed in September. But I'm getting, uh, I suppose, the, the kind of a, a story or the narrative that you're really pushing forward here is that we're going to see a pivot coming through from the Fed. In that case, if we are going to see the Fed maybe pulling in the reins a little bit in terms of letting the aggressiveness run wild, where are you positioning on the, the US side? Is it more looking for perhaps opportunities in some of those stocks, like the consumer stocks, for example, that everyone assumes is going to get absolutely smashed if we do continue to see this tightening. Where, where are you going? Well, there are two areas that we have aggressive positions in the U.S. One is biotech, as we said, uh, that's had a big run. We've, we're seeing animal spirits come into that sector, a half dozen multi-billion dollar deals just in the last two months. The drug pipeline is now open that the FDA has moved its focus from COVID uh, back to regular drugs. And believe it or not, we have uh, our third largest position, which is now moved uh, up because it's doubled in the last month, uh, is an auto parts supplier. And, and this is based, called uh, Cooper Standard. This is based on the fact that auto chips, the supply chains are starting to ease up. Uh, we saw from all the chip makers, whether it was Taiwan Semiconductor, Qualcomm, NXPI, their consumer electronics businesses were down, their handsets business were down. But what was up? Auto chips and industrial. So those chips are getting to the OEMs, the, the GMs, the Fords, and all these auto suppliers that have huge operating leverage that have been left for dead are now getting bid because as the OEMs get chips, they need the parts from the suppliers. The suppliers have huge operating leverage, and that's why you're seeing some of these things rip off the bottom. I think that trend is going to persist for the next 6 to 18 months. There's two years of backlog for new cars. Dealer inventories are at multi-decade lows, uh, so there's a lot of, uh, lot, lot of room to run moving forward on that side. Uh, as far as the emerging markets, uh, we still like uh, some opportunities in China looking out one to two years, and we have a reasonably sized uh, heavyweight in Alibaba still, which is unpopular, but that's our knitting. That's, that's why we were in the trenches when biotech was in the hole. That's why we were in the trenches when the auto suppliers were in the hole, and same thing with China. We think that will be an opportunity, but you got to just get through the short-term uh, overhang and the short-term headline noise. Even though they've handed their code to the regulator, the cyberspace regulator, Alibaba that is? Look, I think it's a miracle that they were flat year on year. If you look, uh, you know, with the shutdowns, with the regulatory crackdown, it shows the strength of the business. Even if you look, everyone's down on China. Look at the money supply growth uh, last month, up 12% year on year. You know, that's the biggest increase in money supply growth since 2016. So, yeah, we got two rate cuts and we got $59.3 billion of liquidity yesterday and everyone was excited about that. There's been so much stimulus uh, and accommodation pumped into the system since November. It has not yet been felt in the economy because you had the, the shutdowns from, uh, you know, in May, April, May and regional shutdowns and, and consumer confidence is low because they never know when another shutdown is coming with zero COVID. But the supply is in there and as things normalize, and they will, I don't know if it's two months from now or you know, 15 months from now, but you're buying, if someone asked you, Tanvir, if you could buy Amazon at a 66% discount with the mm -hmm. AWS growth curve just, just beginning, would you be interested? And we believe that's the opportunity with Alibaba and we're willing to weather. You know, the most important organ in investing is not the head, it's the stomach. And sometimes you gotta sit through the short-term volatility for the long-term reward. <laughs> Digest it, right? <laughs> Digest it well. Exactly. Uh, um, uh, Tom, have to also uh, get your thoughts in on Disney and some of the retail uh, names that you like, like Walmart. But on Disney in specific, I mean, hedge fund manager Dan Loeb has bought a new stake in the business. So is, is it like suddenly now the herd mentality, everybody's getting into Disney? Yeah, look, Disney's off the bottom. We were talking about it weekly uh, before Dan got involved. We think it's an uh, incredible opportunity. The
The parks have a huge moat. People are back out. They have to take their kids to the parks because they haven't been able to do it for two years. You saw their subscriptions on the streaming beat Netflix. So he basically wants to unlock value. He thinks they're going to spin out ESPN. That's a cash flow positive business. I don't think management will actually do it because they want that cash flow for earnings uh, to make their earnings look good. But uh, it's a great idea. It's just emphasizing the discrete value of ESPN on a standalone basis. He wants more buybacks and he wants more cost cutting. He'll probably get some of it, but more than anything else, he'll get attention on the stock, which will drive the price up. Uh, and it's a it's a high quality business still down 40 percent from its highs. So we agree with Dan Loeb on that one for sure. Love you to have you on the show, Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, do come by again soon uh, and talk stocks with us. Uh, uh, great to have your insights this morning. And we'll thank you very much for being a part of that conversation.